uh, we're hearing the talk, um, the new Windows I.O. manager and GHC9 by uh, Tamar Christina, who works on the Haskell compiler on Windows. Um, if you have any questions during the talk, uh, you can raise your hand via Zoom and then I'll allow you to unmute yourself or uh, write some questions in our Slack channel, which you can find via join.nunihack.de. Or if you're already in uh, the workspace, uh, you can find those channel by the browser. Okay, then let's begin. All right, thank you. So as Nicholas says, uh, this talk is about the new um, Windows IO Manager in GC9, which I call WinIO. So a quick introduction about myself. Uh, I'm a compiler engineer at uh, Arm Holdings, where I'm the technical lead of uh, toolchain performance for certain workloads, particularly server and infrastructure. Uh, there, I work primarily on Linux, and we focus on the GNU toolchain, so GCC, Penutils, GLFC, et cetera. And I'd like to take this opportunity to also say that all opinions in this talk are my own, and they have no relationship with my employer. Uh, in terms of GC, I've been contributing to the compiler since about 2015, and primarily on Windows, where I've mostly been working on the runtime linker or any other architecture in the room bit, and quite a lot of bug fixes. So to give a little bit of context, let's answer the question, what's an IO manager? Now, that's a pretty broad topic. But in the context of GC and WinIO, I'll consider anything that handles console input and output, from socket and pipes, so read and writes, file read and writes, and timers. So particularly if you do something like thread delay or um, asleep inside the Haskell world. And also IO events. And I'll get later to what an IO event is. But first, let's talk about the current IO manager in, uh, in JC, which is called MIO, which stands for multi-core input and output. Now, MIO was designed at a time where multiple processors and multiple cores started becoming popular, in which case we needed a way to scale across all these different cores. And so it was designed to particularly address this issue. And how it did so was it, it, it designed itself as an event-based IO system. Now, it's, the way it was set up, it was set up to take advantage of GSC's green threads. So if you don't know, GSC has lightweight threads. And these lightweight threads are multiplexed over multiple hardware, hardware, I'm sorry, multiple OS threads. And I'll go a little bit more into detail later. But in order for you to understand why Mio didn't work as well on Windows, we first have to discuss about the technology it was based to work with. And that technology is EPOL. EPOL is a Linux Unix uh, IO, IO subsystem, which is based on a readiness um, event system. So essentially, it tells you whenever a file descriptor is ready to do the action that you want to do. So for instance, if you want to read a file, it will tell you, hey, you can now start reading the file. Whereas Windows, the native IO manager system is a request based, is a request completion based system. So essentially it tells you, you wanted to read the file and that read has now completed. And so this is not really a, a philosophical difference. It's a real hard issue. The problem is while you can emulate a completion, evade, a completion based system with a um, request based one, you can't emulate a request a request based one using a completion based system. So, which is why on Windows, which that is not a POSIX operating system, couldn't really work with, with Neo. So instead, what was done in GEC was that on Windows, you would use an older interface called Select2, which would issue blocking calls. So if you did, if you would try to read a file, that file would completely block the, the native OS thread. Now to sort of work around this, there were various creative workarounds, one of which was designing some primitives that allowed the Haskell world to hand off the work to a different thread running in um, a loop in C. But you only had one such thread. So if you issue a file read, you essentially block it. So that aside, we have to answer the issue of why we wanted to create a new one instead of trying to get the Mio to actually work? Well, the majority of the reasons are that 
MIO would have addressed this console, for instance. And console IO is one of the things that we get more reports on. So going back for 13 years, there have been reports that the console outputs are either slow, broken, or just weird. So one of the issues is that it supports no uncut input. And uncut input means that usually when you type a, a sentence on a terminal, the program doesn't get to see it before you press enter. So that's a cooked input. An uncooked one is the program gets to see the, the characters as you type. Now, why is this important? For instance, think about asking the user for their password. If you can't support an uncooked system, you can't hide the characters as they're, as they're being typed. Uh, but also one of the primary reasons is that we have a lot more users of Windows outside of a typical Western locale in which you would require Unicode to be able to print out even basic things like their, like their names. But if you try to print out a Unicode character, like a simple Lambda, you would oftentimes just crash with an error, say invalid argument. And the reason for this is that the default locale in Windows is a bit odd. It's what they call an OEM locale which essentially means um, whatever the OEM sets or whatever your region defaults to. Uh, even, if you fix, even if you change that or set your locale, the output is very unpredictable because of the fact that the APIs that, that GC is calling were not set up to handle Unicode. Now, File.io and Sockets.io had their own complete different set of issues. And particularly, you, can't, you couldn't really cancel a request. You can answer all requests or none at all. And this is because all your requests are, have been bound to that, uh, that, that one work, worker thread. So if you, ins if you issue the cancellation, the OS will just kill everything associated with it. And this is quite bad if, for instance, you're copying a big file and you just want to copy that and stop that, that other file. Uh, another big issue was that you couldn't really gracefully abort sockets. Again, same issue. You could cancel all the sockets or none. There are workarounds in which you basically create a new OS thread to read from, and then you kill the OS thread. But that requires you to spawn an OS thread for each socket connection, which is quite expensive. And in particular for sockets as well, we only supported blocking calls. So if you do send and receive, again, to actually support a multi-thread server, you, you need actual multiple threads. So this limited your performance and scaling because for each thread, you require more OS resources and you require a threat management, et cetera. But even if you did all of that, it would still be somewhat unreliable. It would just randomly crash. So then we decided, okay, let's just create a new IO manager and we're going to do it in Haskell. Before we arrived at that conclusion, we considered a few other alternatives, chief of which is the popular um, libuv library which is used by Node.js and a couple of other projects. And it supports multiple interfaces and IO managers. Now, the problem with this is that, as I explained before, you can't really emulate one, one system with another one. So as you abstract away, you get less flexibility. And on top of that, it uses an old interface that, is, that was there since the original design of the Windows IO system, which allows you to only dequeue a single completion packet at a time which is okay, but if you're trying to scale to multiple connections, it's kind of silly to go, hello, one, one, one at a time. And the last reason is it hides a lot of information from the RTS, from, from the runtime. So the runtime really wouldn't know what's going on until, the, until, the information is, is, until your request is fully completed. By doing it in Haskell, we can teach the runtime to actually know what you're doing. So it can say, for instance, this thread is still blocked on an IO request, go do something else, give it time slice away, Stuff like that. Um, but doing it in Haskell had, uh, had some significant issues, in particular with the non threaded runtime. But I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll come back to that later. Uh, to understand how it all works, we need to take a look at the types of IO interfaces that Windows provides and how they work a bit. So, Currently in, G in GHC, we use FDs on both Windows and Linux, which sort of makes sense because all the interfaces that are being used are, are, the, are either POS6 or a, a Linux-based one. The problem with FDs are that, like I said before, Windows isn't a POS6 operating system. 
usually in the process, you have an FD table, which maps from your FD number to the resource. On Linux or a POSIX system, when you create a child process, this table is copied into, into the child so they can inherit the, the FDs from the parent. On Windows, this is not the case because the whole FD and POSIX stuff is emulated in, in user mode. So you can't really do that. So it means that a lot of the time we have to copy back and forth between um, FDs and handles, which are the native Windows uh, resource pointer. So if you have to keep doing that, then why support FDs at all? So with WinIO, we just drop FD support and we only support handles. Now to the normal user, this doesn't mean anything. If you, if you use the, the abstract GAC type called handle, then you're fine. But if your library has decomposed the FD handle on the, the handle in GC to get to the native FD, then you will be in trouble. The other thing about handles is that handles are quite expensive to create. And the reason for this is that at creation time, a lot of security checks and ACL checks are performed, so ACL or access, access control checks. And if you keep doing this over and over and over and over again, you will jump, generate a complete, uh, Significantly slow program. So think about, for instance, um, LD or BFD on Windows compared to Linux. They are exactly the same code base, yet on Windows, the write is a lot slower. And that is because Windows APIs are based around handles, while a lot of POSIX APIs are based around the file paths. So if you do something like fopen stat, they all take a file path. Now, while you have Overloads of these that take uh, FDs as well, they're very rarely used. So you mostly use, use the path, which is an issue because if you call stat over and over again, you keep calling create, um, create file to create a handle over and over and over again. And so that, that's why if you port a software just directly from, from Linux or POSIX to Windows, it'll end up being slower. So again, inside GFC, we decided, okay, we're going to completely eliminate the use of file paths. We're just gonna pass around um, handles. This works great, except for the problem that file paths in Haskell are described as strings, which is a bit annoying because it means that whenever we try to use the native Windows string format, we have to keep translating back and forth. Now, what do I mean by that? The, I have to make a small detour first to Unicode. So Unicode in Windows is uh, done using UTF-16, whereas on Linux or most POSIX system, it's UTF-8. On Windows, the APIs are split into two variants. So you have the A variants, or the ones that ends with A that stands for ANSI. The ones that ends with W stands for white characters. Now the white characters are the more modern ones, uh, modern in quotes, they've been there since uh, Windows NT, NT4 or something, uh, but, in, but the important thing is that the white versions support Unicode, but GC internally is UTF-8. So we have to do some re-encoding anytime we call a Windows function. Now we could have switched GC internally to UTF-16 for WinIO, which we will do eventually when WinIO is the default. But the reason we haven't done so is because we would have to, um, if you want to do this dynamically, we would have had to make changes that would have affected a lot more external packages. So we decided we'll just take the hit for now. But coming back to what I said earlier about the native Windows file paths, uh, I think everyone that's using Windows has hit this problem before, where you try to open a file and it'll tell you your file path is too long. Not with those exact nice terms, it'll just say file not found. The important thing is that the max path or the limit of a file size of a file path of a maximum of 255 characters is just an artificial limitation by the um, by the APIs to imp impose for backwards compatibility. And the reason for this is there's a lot of old software that have hard coded the num the number 255 as the buffer size. So they either expect back a buffer of 255 characters or they give in a buffer of 255. 155 characters. And so in order for these programs not to break or have any overflows, et cetera, the API imposes this limit. So how do you bypass it? Well, if you remember the white character version of the APIs, those can take a native file path format. What are those? 
the windows those are called file namespaces so if you see for instance um, a file path starting with c post um, colon slash which is your normal windows file path those are the ones that will be processed by the api now these have a couple of advantages uh, forward slash and backward slashes mean the exact same thing so you can use them back and forth you can use a relative path you can use paths with have um, relative markers in it, so dot dot and, and dot slash, et cetera. And it will normalize these and handle them for you. However, if you start with uh, slash slash question mark slash, you're telling it that you want to use file path space on the Win32 file namespace. What this will do is tell it, do not do any processing at all on my, on my file path, and pass it directly into the, to the, um, to the driver, which is great because this limits the limitation from max path from 25 characters and lifts it up to 32K characters. Now, the, the problem here is that if you had a relative path before, that will no longer work because the driver really has no idea about the context of the program. So anytime you do something in GC, we have to do the processing that the API layer used to do. So we will resolve relative paths, we will norm normalize slashes, et cetera, before, before we pass them through. And also, if you've worked on Windows or interacted with it, you know that there are certain characters that are reserved. So if you ever try to get a file called COM1, for instance, anywhere, it will tell you you can't do that. Um, that limitation is, again, an artificial limitation based on the API. So today, if you pass GC COM1, it will happily create a file called COM1 for you, which is problematic because how, um, how do you actually read a COM device then? That's where the secondary namespace com comes in, the device one, which is starts with slash slash dot and slash. Anything you put behind there gives you raw access to, to the device. And one of the reasons for supporting this, aside from max from lifting the max path, is that now with GC or Windows, you can actually access um, the, the raw bytes on a, on a device. For instance, if you want to write a disk defragger tool or an undeleted tool, for instance. And the reason that now works is because drive paths are essentially an artificial thing in, in Windows. It's imposed by, um, the, by user mode, just as in Linux, it's just a, a normal mount point. So if you type, for instance, mount fall on Windows, it'll tell you what your drive paths are actually mounted to, and that's the path that the, that the driver is actually using. So if you want to, for instance, open the volume that your hard disk at C is mounted on, all you have to do is use is to place the question mark with a dot and you can have full raw access. So when I, like I said, deals exclusively with these kinds of paths and it will translate them back and forth for you transparently. If you do give it a namespace path already, just like the API driver, it'll just completely up out of processing. It'll just pass it, pass it straight on. So now we get a bit about the design of the IO manager itself. It's designed around three core principles, one of which is we never ever want to block during the call graph of a user call, at long block in a, foreign, in a foreign call. So what that means is that if the user calls some read file, nowhere in that line will we block on an, on an external call. And this is important because it allows the, the runtime to be able to, um, to be able to um, know what what that call is and schedule around it and also more importantly keep its resources around but without blocking the underlying os thread because now we don't have a separate thread anymore in 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 c the second thing is that since we're using the asynchronous interface we want to treat the calls as asynchronous all the way through so absolutely nowhere do we want a synchronization block or any anywhere that would limit um, limit scalability and we want this even in the run thread up on RTS. We also want maximum overlap between the non threaded and the thread on RTS. In pre-GC9, the IO manager had a completely different implementation for threaded and completely different for non threaded Because believe it or not, non threaded is a lot, it's a lot harder to actually get to work correctly. Um, but this introduced a couple of issues. When a user reports a bug, I, we don't really know um, even how to start because we need to know which, which, which IO manager it was using. Once you know that, the problem may exist in both. It may exist in just one. It 
So it became a, a maintenance nightmare. So we want to use about uh, as much as possible. So before we had to get started, we had to make some changes into base because like I said, the IO manager is completely asynchronous. And if it's asynchronous, we run into a couple of problems. So when you do a read file on a string, a uh, byte string is, is different, but I'll cover just string for now. GC uses two internal, internal buffers. One of them is a byte buffer, which is your read buffer. And the other one is a char buffer, which is your decode buffer. So when you, when you ask GC to read a, a line from a file, it will go out and it will request a, a full buffer, buffer words of bytes from the file. And this size would be either 8 or 32K, depending on which interface you use. After the buffer is filled, the char buffer then decodes the bytes into the characters. Now, the reason there are two buffers is because we don't know ahead of time which encoding the, um, the, the string need, need, needs to be in. So you might consume multiple bytes to produce a single character. So only when your character buffer runs out, it will go back to the byte buffer. Only when the byte buffer runs out, it will go request more from the OS. Uh, the structure for that look is uh, it's exactly this structure. You have a pointer to your native uh, to, to your native buffer, the state where it's read or write, the size, and the left and right pointer, which is great. But now all our requests are asynchronous. And the problem with an asynchronous request is we can't rely on the kernel tracking the file pointer for us anymore because we've told it we're, 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 go we're going to do it. So we must keep track of the location where we are reading and writing. And the benefit of this is that we no longer have to go back to the OS to answer a, lo a lot of questions. Like if you use FTEL or seek, most of the time we can handle it without going out to the OS and issuing an, uh, an IO request. The only exception to this is uh, seek of minus one when you're at the start of a file, seek of minus n or plus n that's beyond the size of the buffer that you've seen so far, because then we don't know anymore and we have to ask the US. To do that, you just add a simple field to the buffer type, not a big deal. The problem is adding this little tiny field triggered a huge amount of changes in base because now we have to track and correctly recalculate this offset for almost every single every single IO interaction in base, which as it turns out, we still missed a few. Even yesterday, I fixed a few with PyString. This also brought with it some issues. Uh, GEC has, uh, is exposed as a library where, where there's a separation between what we consider the GEC API and some of it that is considered internal. Now, some projects have used some internal interfaces from GEC. And this is highly, pro highly problematic because it limits our ability to make uh, intrusive changes. Uh, unfortunately, we still had to do a couple. So as I mentioned before, if you have deconstructed the handle type, you will have to do some changes, regardless whether your project works on Windows or not. It, it, you will have to do some changes. If you, if you use the, um, any of the internal GC buffers, again, you will need to do some fix up because you will need to pass around the, the file pointer. So remember I was talking about threaded versus non-threaded and how difficult non-threaded is. So to answer that, let's look at the uh, typical Haskell program. So you have your Haskell code running at, at the top. You have some kind of synchronization primitives there on the side, so an MVAR, SCM. You have a lightweight, lightweight thread scheduler running. And you have an OS thread pool and a couple of capabilities. Now your green threads are multiplexed over your capabilities and the capability is bound to an OS thread. So you have about two levels of multiplexing during threaded, which sounds complicated, but at least it gives you locks. Non-threaded removes the OS thread and puts down a single OS, OS uh, thread and removes every single lock in the RTS. Because the, in, the idea is that if you have only one OS thread, well, you can never really have concurrency issues on the native side which is great, it's faster, but it means that we can no longer safely re-enter the RTS from, from native code. So for the non-trailer case, we had to reverse the, 
the event system, as in, instead of telling it when an IO is done, it actively asks you during, during the scheduler run, hey, do you have any finished IO requests? And that was the only safe way for us to do it, but it means that you're not as responsive to things as, uh, on, as, the, as a thread version. So if you press Control C and you aborted something, you have to wait till the next scheduler run for it to recognize it. We just typically just a couple of nanoseconds, so it's not a big deal on, in general, but it's a bit slower. But yeah, like I said before, non trial gives you all the concurrency issues without any of the solutions. It also gives you another problem. Most of the synchronization primitives in Haskell are designed around an MVAR. Now, MVAR is a, is a pretty nice data structure. It has one property that on the surface is great, but in, re in reality for the IO manager, it's pretty bad, which is it prevents, dev it prevents deadlocks. And why is this a problem? Well, in the threaded world, having nothing to do is a valid state to be in. So it recognizes that while I may not have any work left in the Haskell side, work may come from outside because it assumes that you can re-enter the RTS. In non-threaded, the assumption is that if you really have no work to do, then you must have done something wrong in, in the program. So what it'll do is it'll forcibly open a lock and perform a full garbage collection in order for it to get more work to do. So if you're blocked on an IO request, it will just cancel that to a garbage collection and start over, which is pretty bad because it just gets you into, a, into an infinite loop. Uh, in order to solve that, we had to introduce a new IO primitive, which is, I think, one of the only ones not derived from an MVAR. It's essentially an MVAR, but it allows only one write to it, because if you re if the request finishes multiple times for some for whatever reason, then that's a bug. Um, it has a different block reason, the RTS, than MVAR. And it avoids, it doesn't have this deadlock avoidance guarantee. So we use it, we expose it to users, but it's a very dangerous primitive. If you use it and use it incorrectly, it will, it will block. Uh, the way it's used in the IO manager is with the call below. You pretty much just try to read from it. And with, whenever you succeed it, your request has either finished or it was canceled. So now that we've discussed a lot of the interfaces, we can take a bit of a thousand foot view about how requests are, are handled. Uh, remember when I said before that we are asynchronous all the way through with no locks, etc. Well, how do we handle knowing which request belongs to which Haskell thread? Because eventually you would, you would have had to look it up somewhere. The way asynchronous request works in Windows is that when you make a, a, a call to the operating system, you have to give it a overlap structure, which is essentially get, I'm telling it where, I'm giving it a pointer telling it where you want the request to happen, giving it an event you want to, to, to be signaled when the event finishes, and giving it the offset. Uh, the event we don't use because events are expensive locks and we want to avoid those. The internal structures get set on, on, on a return with the status of, of the call. So this is the only structure we, we actually get back when a call finishes. Uh, there's another difficulty in that requests can be canceled at any given time. So we really don't know what's going to finish first. If the request finishes or if the cancellation finished first or if something else handled the request uh, but like I said, we don't want to look it up in a map. Now, a nice benefit of the way the API structures, the API structure in Windows, is that the OS will only read these 32 bytes, which is great because it means we can hang data off of them. So if we stuff that request into our own type, which we call a Haskell overlap, you have to put the overlap structure first. So this will occupy the first 32 bytes. After that, we can put in anything we want. In this case, we've chosen to put in a pointer to a different structure. So just add an indirection. And the reason we've done this is twofold. The indirection allows each implementation of uh, event handler to pick its own payload, but it also allows us to keep the size of the structure down. So in this case, it only makes it uh, 40 bytes 
which still means you can squeeze about three or so in, in a, on a single cash line. And this becomes important when you have bins or sockets because you don't want to keep hitting cash misses just to read out the, the overlap structure. The, the structure that it's pointing to basically has a handle to the, to the, well, to the handle of the operation that you started, either file, socket, pipe, etc. And it has an opaque pointer. This opaque pointer is just pointing back to, uh, to a, it's, a, it's pointing to the location of the Haskell function where the receiver is blocked. So basically it's, blo it's, it's the location to the, to the right for the IO port. So what do we do? This pointer, we only access it using atomic operations. And I'll explain how it does it in a bit. So when the user starts a request, for instance, in this case, reading a file, this is how the call looks like. We have a, a default implementation of an IO handler in base, which is called with overlap. You give it the handle that you're reading from, the offset you want to read from, and two, um, and two high, high order functions. A, the function to actually start the request and one to tell it how to interpret the request. In this case, it's gonna call it's gonna call on the native read file, pass it the information. The with overlap function will give you an additional pointer, which is your overlap structure, and you tell it the result. This none has a special meaning, but I'll get to that in the next two slides. When the IO manager finishes handling your your request, it'll come back and ask you, so I've got this error code. What what does it actually mean? So that's where your completion comes in. It gives you the error code and the number of bytes if they are available. So if you can see basically error success, end of line, um, broken pipe, et cetera, all mapped to a successful read. Some of them with data, other ones with zero and everything else we map to a failure. So if you look at how with overlap works, as I said before, the will on the same thing is that you get the two callback pointers the first thing we do is we create a new IO port that's on where the requests are will be listening and we wrap around them two functions, one for success and one for failure. Then we have to mask out any other exceptions and we wrap the, the completion call with our own completion call, which is essentially interpreting what the user gives us back. If they tell us it's successful, we will release, release the threat using a success Otherwise, we release it using a, a failure. Quite simple. Um, here we create the um, a, uh, the pointer that you saw in the C in the C side. So we create a completion data with the handle and the pointer to this function. Below this, which I didn't include, is where it, it creates the foreign pointer. So it, so the garbage collector paints it in memory and writes it into in, into the structure. So after a whole lot of boilerplate code, it finally gets to the runner. Now the runner will essentially just do a read IO port. And if that one is filled, we call cancel. So what, what, is it, what, is, what does this do? This is the point at where the user's uh, read file will block if the request hasn't finished yet. Because from the from this moment you actually do the request, it's already started running. And that's where the none from before comes in. So when you do a request, the possible statuses are these. So done will say, well, by the time I got to the IO manager, the operating system has, had already completed it. So I am not going to bother entering the, the event into the, um, into the IO manager, which is great because it saves us a couple of calls back, back and forth and a kernel mode tr transition. We've also optimized Windows to tell that if you do complete something asynchronously, don't, don't create an event for it. You can get back a pending um, status, which essentially tells that, okay, this event, this read or write or something, it's going to take a long time. So go, go out and wait for it asynchronously. You can also get back an incomplete status, which means the result has, the call is almost finished, but it hasn't been done yet but I'm going to finish it synchronously. So in this case, we just enter a, a, essentially a, a busy loop 
And you could, well, if you get an error, then you, it says you're done. If you return none, you're telling the IO manager that the API doesn't have any special um, any special flags or error codes. So that the IO manager will transparently handle it using the, the default ones it, know, it knows about. And for the majority of calls, none is fine. So how does the IO manager event loop work? So the third one is a lot easier to, to explain. So as I mentioned before, the IO manager also handles timers. So if you do a thread delay of a couple of milliseconds or whatever, the IO manager is a thing that will signal your, your thread. Now we're, we combine the, the timer handling with the IO handling by using the timers or the nearest timer as the amount of time to wait for an IO event. So essentially that's the first thing we calculate here. It goes over the, the, the timer queue, which is a priority queue and just gets the highest priority timer. This one determines for how long we block in this call. This call is an OS call that essentially waits until any requests are finished. If you do something like press Control C to cancel something, we issue an empty completion to this to this queue. So it'll wake up thinking it has some work to do. It'll immediately discard that that empty request, but it'll still go to to the steps to recalculate the timers and and check if, if anything else finished. Now this call has some interesting properties and in that any OS thread that enters it will immediately be associated with, with the this IO queue. What does that mean? If that thread blocks for any reason other than re-entering this function, the OS will assume that the thread could, couldn't handle the, um, the, the, the IO events that it was given. The OS will then awaken if they, if they're available, another thread with the same list of, of, of requests and tell it, okay, go handle these because the previous one didn't finish. So this allows us to, to scale quite, um, quite well. So anytime it hits this notify running function, we essentially spawn a new, a new thread if there are none available and tell it to go, to go wait. And this is how we can keep continuous, continuously responding to requests, even while we're processing a batch of, of other requests. Uh, it'll do this till you reach a limit. The, when it started running, it'll call process completion with a list of, of events to go through, which is this function. And this function does what I mentioned before. So you get your overlap structure, which it then casts to the Haskell format. Then it finds the offset of the field where we have our payload, adjust the pointer. Then we read it and we do an atomic exchange. So this is how we handle any, any asynchronous issues. So the first thread that's able to get back here something other than a null, a null request, that's the one that, that's, that's going to handle the, handle the actual request. So in this way, we don't have to have a hash table to do any lookups or anything of the sort, which is why the first thing after you do this is you check to see if, you, if you're the one that's, that's responsible to handle this. And if you are, it's quite simple. You, re you request the status of the, of, the, of the work from the OS and you call the callback that was deconstructed at, at this site. And the callback here is the one that will call back to the user which unblocks the thread. And that's really it. After that, we do some basic checks for, for scaling. So if, for instance, we start off allowing you to, to, to do 64 requests at, at a time, but if you're in a high IO situation like sockets, where you may have millions, we will continuously scale up. So you can, uh, um, every time you do so, we double it. So at a single point, you can, um, you, you, yeah. If you, are, if you are still in the high IO contention, you keep growing, 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 growing. And that's how we handle the, the scalability without always consuming a lot of system resources. So how do you use it? Well, it's been merged in GC9, but it's currently off by default. Now, for a, for a couple of releases, all binaries will have both um, runtime managed in it. So you can switch dynamically at runtime. Um, in order for you to do that, you have to compile your binaries with dash RTS ops to enable RTS options. 
and you can pass it the option plus RTS, IO manager equals native. Now this has um, a useful meaning on Linux as well in that the native on Linux means just use whatever is there. So if you want to use the new ones, you can just always use it. Or if you want to enable it by default in your binary, you can compile it with dash with RTS op equals IO manager equals native. So what's next? Well, fixed plots. We know there are plenty of it because the IO system in GEC is huge. And there's a lot of things that we have to change. But it should be stable enough for most people to play around it. But more importantly, for us to do enablement in network. One of the other primary reasons for doing this was because Windows supports a technology called the Rio, since they're coming for reasons now, which is essentially a high scalability network interface which allows you to re, um, significantly reduce the number of CPU cycles you have to spend for any network operation. Uh, our hope is to be able to turn this on by default around the GC 9.4 timeframe. And well, hopefully it will fix a lot of the issues. Also, like I said, there, there's plenty of work to do on Windows. So if anyone wants to help out, you're always welcome. You don't really have to know the compiler. You just have to be a bit comfortable in C. And I also like to thank Ben and Andreas for their help in actually getting us over the finish line. Are there any questions? I'll give, I've given you permissions to unmute yourself. So if you have any questions, just speak up or write in the Slack channel. Uh, may I? Hello, can you, can Hello. you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tama, for uh, for your work and for your uh, and for this uh, talk. Um, did I get it right that uh, the networking is not enabled yet with the, this new I/O? Yeah. Manager? Correct. So that's the reason why it's not on by default but we needed to have it in the compiler before we could start discussing network. Um, network is a bit of a issue because we have to essentially re redesign the entire library. Um, so there, there's uh, some discussions going on upstream. We will probably redesign it for both for all operating system and provide some backwards compatible interfaces to the current interface. Uh -huh. so, for, uh, so the changes are about uh, file IO and uh, console IO for Windows. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. So it, so one of the things it does, for instance, Unicode will be handled transparently. So even if your locale isn't correct, it will switch your locale for you automatically at startup and switch it back when it either crashes or, or is exiting. And it will only do this if you haven't manually changed your, your locale, so if it's still the system default but it means that most programs will be able to output and read Unicode just fine. I see. But, um, do you have an idea of how much uh, work and or time would it take to, to support the network as well? Uh, basic support? Based on your current experience. Yeah, so basic support should be doable in a single GC release cycle. So um, um, that's probably like six months or so. And that's mostly uh -huh. because if I, so based on my time, I can only work on weekends. So that's why it, it takes a long time. If other people could achieve it, it shouldn't take that long because network has always used the correct native interfaces. It just wasn't using them asynchronously. So a lot of the work is just on doing the right plumbing. Yeah. But supporting Rio, um, which is where we, sorry? Yeah, 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 go ahead. So what supporting Rio, which is really one of the big reasons um, we want to enter this interface, that's gonna take a bit longer. But Rio should make a significant performance difference. I see. Thank you. 
So are there any other questions here? And uh, if you if you allow me, just uh, to be clear, was uh, sure. how, how many how many uh, how many developers besides you were working on the all of these changes? Because I see this is a huge amount of work. Uh, how long? This was originally started uh, three years ago by a contributor that wanted to make a, a stable networking for their application. I forgot his name at the moment, but it wasn't uh, it, it it wasn't in a in any state that we could really use it. So at some point, I rewrote a lot of it. Um, it's essentially three years worth of work, uh, and it spent a year or so in in review because it was quite huge. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was mostly me. At the end, uh, Ben and Andreas also helped out to get uh, to, especially with uh, fixing a couple of the issues that I didn't have time to, to track down. Mm -hmm. But no, it was essentially about three years worth of work just on my own. I think the, the request was so large, it essentially, if you open it in GitLab, it just slowed GitLab down. Thank you. Uh, there's, also, there's a question in the channel. Is Rio the alternative preboot lib? No, um, Rio is a is a short for registered IO and it's a direct memory access technology. So essentially when, a, when you start an IO request, the buffer has to stay in place, but the kernel won't write into a, a user mode buffer. So it'll pin the buffer in memory and move and have a copy of it in kernel space. It'll finish your request, then it'll copy the data from kernel back to, to user mode, which causes context switches and significant overhead from moving data around. So what Rio does is you will tell the kernel, you will give the kernel a fixed buffer where you handle your request from, and it'll pin these in a shared memory location between the kernel and the user mode. So once the request is finished, the data is right there. So the kernel doesn't have to copy, which is why your CPU time goes down significantly and your number of drop packets goes down as well because it doesn't really have to do a lot of processing. Well, then if there are no more questions, I would thank you and introduce applause. So unmute yourself or write in the Slack chat. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks for your talk. <laughs>